Locked on Blue Devils here. J.J. Jackson spending some time with my good pal John Garcia, Jr., the director of recruiting for Sports Illustrated on today's program. we got to talk about National Signing Day that has come and gone and the efforts of Mike Elko and his staff. Tremendous work from them putting together this recruiting class for the class of 2023. And as always, our conversations with John Garcia, Jr. and our buddy Jason Jordan are brought to you by our friends over at LinkedIn the official recruiting sponsor for the Locked On Network. Post your job for free, linkedin.com slash Locked On College. John, I certainly do appreciate the time. Happy New Year to you, my friend. Uh, and what a remarkable job Mike Elko and his staff were able to do. Yeah, likewise, JJ, and likewise for Duke. Yeah, this, this group, it's so rare on a lot of fronts, right? First of all, to get more than two dozen prospects on board, before that first game, before the opener in 22, before we saw this turnaround, this revival on the field, to have buy-in from, from two dozen recruits from 12 states, by the way, is really remarkable. And then to have held on to all of them as other teams lost out on recruits, as other teams circled back on other kids that were committed, and just kind of the natural ebb and flow of the cycle – to retain those recruits all the way through and have all 26 sign on signing day. I mean, just remarkable all the way around and very atypical of not only a new coaching staff, but any coaching staff in this day and age. You can go to the Georgias, the Bamas, the Clemsons, the Ohio States. There's decommitments everywhere during right. the season, after the season. Duke doesn't suffer one from the moment, uh, you know, kickoff 2022 begins. So a lot of interesting statistics with this Duke class, it's diverse, it's balanced, and it's also really good, which is probably the most important part. That's what we like to hear, and it's a, it's a, been a good football season for Duke. To, to finish the regular season with the 8-4 and four mark, you get the opportunity to play in the Military Bowl, which is such an exciting opportunity that Duke has only played in, in I mean, less than 20 bowl games all time. They're not used to that. And going back to the fact that this is such a brand-new staff, it is the first year that Mike Elko was able to – uh, compete and conclude. How impressive is that simply in that you're selling a message and yet all these recruits when they were jumping on didn't know the end result, John. They didn't know that this team would go eight and four because as we said, they remained solid the whole time throughout. It's not like these were last minute gets that Duke was able to get with their football class. Yeah, JJ, that would have been understandable too, right? If it was like, right. hey, the class was 12 to 15 players and then boom, after the eight and four season, a bunch more wanted to jump in and, and there's nothing wrong with that, but not having to deal with that really enables you to focus on the normal things a little bit more, right? Game planning, roster management, which is such an issue for every coaching staff in the country. So again, uh, just a luxury for Duke to be able to navigate the season without having to worry about recruiting at least as much as others. Of course, you're worried about keeping those guys, you're bringing them in for official visits. You're going to visit them as a coaching staff, but yeah, I just really like this group that they put together and, and the timing of it. Again, as, as ideal as possible. It helps you move on and it'll probably, I'm sure we'll see in the next few weeks and months, it'll probably help you jumpstart the class of 2024, which now can take some of yeah. those overtures of not only do we have to have this belief like the 23 class did, but now we've got some tangible on-field results in, in what this program could look like going into the future. So theoretically, your ceiling which was a top 25 type class this year, maybe goes even higher into next year, which is, again, we're in, in Duke standards, all of that is a very big deal individually. So collectively, it's massive and it's something that, you know, is really remarkable and easy to forget about because there's so much other stuff going on, coaching changes, decommitments, controversy, NIL, yeah. all this other stuff. Easy to forget about those programs that were just kind of like, yep, we had these commits. We signed them, and let's move on to, to our bowl game. You know, it, it, easy to overlook those kind of programs. So Duke certainly deserves its due. So from his time at Texas A&M, at Notre Dame, with Dave Clawson at Wake Forest and Bowling Green, what do we truly know? What do you know throughout your career, John, of Mike Elko, the recruiter? Well, he was always known as a rock-solid recruiter, obviously, you know, particularly on the defensive side of the ball relative to some of these other stops that he's had. But I think now as a head coach, you're seeing this combination of ambition and execution uh, that, that is really special uh, among, 
head coaching prospect or head coaching recruiters, I should say, because again, the timeline of all of this is is exactly how every school sort of draws it up. You draw it up to to apex in the off season so that you can pivot to your season without having to allocate so many resources over to recruiting. So I think the the one element we didn't really know of Elko was CEO like how, how does the overall execution go down under your watch in total uh, in totality I should say as opposed to hey go execute this recruiting uh this recruit prospect go execute this side of the board go build this side of the board we've seen those elements at different stops when you're the head coach it's the entire all encompassing approach to recruiting and the results really speak for themselves. You've got a, a lot of ambitious gets out of state, out of region, 12 states. I uh, did a little research. 12 states is the most represented on a Duke commitment or signing list for the last decade, right? Wow. So the most ambitious, tangibly, the most ambitious Duke class. And you expected it to reach back out into that entire Southeastern footprint. And you certainly expected at least some input into Texas, but they hit the entire Eastern Seaboard, the entirety of that ACC footprint on top of it. And that's where I think I was a little bit more surprised in that Duke approach. And again, those commitments coming in well before kickoff 2022. So I'm sure the on-field product solidified a lot of them and, and, and confirmed a lot of the belief they had. But I think just the ambition and kind of overall structure of how to build a class was really impressive uh, under Mike Elko. And that's really the one element we hadn't been able to evaluate because he hadn't been in this position prior. All right, I got to get you to uh, give us some input on some of these players that have signed a letter of intent that are going to be coming to play Duke football. We have spoke previously here on the program, John, and talked about Grayson Loftus, the quarterback who becomes the first commit of the Mike Elko era for Duke. He yep. sees Riley Leonard really take a step forward as a sophomore quarterback in the ACC this past season, and as any great class goes, a quarterback is typically there for it. Out of Gaffney, South Carolina, Grayson Loftus is the quarterback for the Blue Devils. And, and you love this get on a lot of fronts. You mentioned the commitment and the timeline of it, so the, the best friend of a coaching staff is a quarterback that has long been on board to be your <laughs> mouthpiece because there are no rules for quarterbacks and other recruits <laughs> recruiting each other, right? There's no communication windows that they have to stay within it is a free game right. you know 12 months a year so i think that was a, a true spearhead for this recruiting class and then grayson individually as a player multiple time state champion uh mo several years as the starter there in gaffney efficient productive uh, provides some athleticism along with a, a relatively strong arm there's a lot to like uh, about grayson as a quarterback but the leadership that we've kind of learned along the way only adds uh, to some of those accolades. So I, I really like this get uh, foundational get because this was a guy that that had overtures from other programs, obviously a kid from South Carolina. So you always wonder how those schools are, are going to get involved. I know West Virginia was involved at one point as well. So this was a high profile win early and it got better as time wore on and as this class uh, was built. Uh, so a, a great uh, sort of ambassador of this first Mike Elko class. And you're seeing a lot of newer coaches, and even in this this um, this coaching uh, cycle, like Luke Fickle just grabbed his 2024 quarterback. You're seeing that as kind of the move. Grab your quarterback early and let him help you build this, this future class out. Uh, so Grayson on and off the field, really important get uh, for the Blue Devils because now that, that position feels elevated based on the end of Cutcliffe's tenor, tenure and then, of course, Riley Leonard's development, as you mentioned, um, in Mike Elko's tenure. So that's what I want to talk about. And again, Kevin Johns, the offensive coordinator, quarterbacks guy that's working with Riley Leonard. You look at the last two or three seasons of Duke football, Duke, one of the five worst teams in the entire sport in terms of quarterback turnovers over the last two seasons. Really, really poor play in the final two years of David Cutcliffe, which was not characteristic whatsoever of his career in its entirety, but that was just simply the fact. And so you hand the reins over to Riley Leonard, who had only played a little bit throughout his freshman year. What can that do in terms of trying to build quarterbacks for future classes and that sort of thing? Oh, it's it's huge because now it's tangible, right? You're, you're utilizing a very modern athletic 
quarterback uh, prospect who has increased and developed in the production department. You know, you go back to Riley Leonard's recruitment. This was a guy who we thought in Alabama was maybe going to be a basketball player. I I had a buddy call me from Auburn's basketball camp and was like, hey, this guy Riley Leonard from Mobile, (laughs) he's really good. and He might be a basketball player. And then, of course, we tracked him more. And he's this this crazy athletic quarterback. So you knew once he was going to be able to create that singular focus on the quarterbacking side, there was an opportunity for, for quick growth. So for it all to come together under a new coaching staff makes it even more remarkable, right? That's not the group that he jumped on board with. Uh, and there was a lot of unknown kind of moldable clay uh, with Leonard's game. So for him to be really the focal point uh, and and the catalyst of of this turnaround offensively is a huge deal because now it's tangible. Um, it, Grayson Loftus bought in even before it became tangible, but now going forward, you can sell that to a wider array of modern quarterbacks, right? Because you're not going to recruit that statue quarterback anymore. Um, it just doesn't fit in this day and age of college football. So to have this clear and easy to see development on the field with Leonard, it's huge. It it almost stands alone as a recruiting tool because you're going to talk about uh, not only wins and bowl games, but turnarounds, the accolades, the individual. I mean, let's, let's, let's hype it up next year already, right? Let's start to run some of that, you know, preseason ACC stuff with, with uh, Riley Leonard right now. I mean, all that stuff absolutely helps you going forward because now it's something that you can see and feel and look back on as opposed to something that's going to be sold as you know a verbal promise which is what all these coaches are great at it just hits different when you've already seen it at their current school as opposed to hey yeah when i was here we did this i was there we did this no here we've done this we did we just did it months ago so that hits a little bit different john garcia jr is here with us the director of uh, football recruiting for sports illustrated talking about the duke blue devils post early signing day so tell me about a couple of other players two or three maybe that really garnered some headlines that are going to be key pieces for Duke football in the years to come well I love the pair of running back gets you know I I know uh, the kid from College Station is well documented because Mike Elko had all these connections to that program having come from A&M but Peyton Jones on his own out of Virginia so two out-of-state gets uh, just kind of the modern build of a running back, a kid who's absolutely explosive, comfortable in space and in the passing game. So when you start to think of compliments to this offense, as you build through a dual threat quarterback and a modern spread scheme, you need these three down pass catchers at running back on top of it. So to be bringing in two of them in the first class, I thought was a big deal. And then my eye kind of drifted towards some, some more of these pass catchers and, and even the sleepers in the class, like a Vincent Drolet who has ties to Canada, played other sports, but look at the frame, 6'5", 220 pounds. He'll give you some Drew Bobo vibes, right? Like he'll give you some Bobo vibes, even though he departed and and started at UCLA. And and that's a, a hybrid wide receiver, tight end type. So again, you start to talk about building your threats. It comes at different levels, right? Dual threat quarterback, think of the RPO game. You need a good running back who can threaten a defense. What comes after that? These big in the seam pass catchers that increase the margin for error when you do uh, pull that ball and try to let it go before your linemen get, you know, illegal downfield uh, markers thrown against them. So these guys increase that margin for error. So I like the combination of getting guys you know who are very good and productive, where the floor is strong. But then on the flip side, your Drolays of the world, Ethan Hubbard's a developmental tackle who's really broken out in the last year and a half at Hoover High School, getting some developmental high ceiling recruits to sort of balance it out is something I really like. Uh, So naturally my eye, JJ, really just went to the future of this Duke offense because I do think that's sort of the catalyst for for the perception of of Duke football here going forward. I love that. John, let me say this. Bobos are running everywhere. That's Jake Bobo that goes from Jake Bobo. Drew Drew Bobo Bobo is with Georgia on the offensive line. And that's kind of where I wanted to transition those offensive linemen. You mentioned Ethan Hubbard there, but you know, in recruiting that quarterback is so important, but in college football, not quite to the level of the SEC where it's definitely one in the trenches, but the ACC wants to become a game of trenches as well. What can you tell me about that front for Duke? Well, Hubbard and, and Caleb Doris in particular out of Tennessee, 
okay. you get this modern profile. Again, you're talking about modernizing this offense. So massive frame, 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, maybe 6'7", six, by the time this recording is done, well under 300 pounds. So you're getting that combination of a great frame to work with and build upon, but you could build it within your scheme. But on the front end, from the floor perspective, now you get great length associated with those frames. And that's how you combat. I mean, think of the defenses that Duke has to face just in the ACC, <laughs> playing your, your NC States, uh, your Clemsons, your Florida States, your Louisville, smaller, twitchier, edge-rushing prospects. So length has become kind of the prerequisite for the offensive tackle position. So Duke is going to bring in at least two pure offensive tackles in this class that have experience and length uh, to their name. And then on the inside, McCrane, the instater, he's a mauler, right? He, yeah. He's the guy who you're going to run behind. He's one who's going to protect at center or guard what Leonard and what, what this running back group of the future is going to look like. And you need that just as much. So with those type of prospects, shorter, stockier, more compact, more weight, you're good with that because they're going to be your drive blockers. They're, they're going to be the guys who push the line of scrimmage forward as opposed to those tackles who are going to work backwards a little bit more than not. Uh, so a solid offensive line haul. It's got some balance to it. Probably would like to see a little bit more. And I know the portal is going to be a factor with that. I think they've already no hit doubt. the portal on the offensive line pretty hard. So overhauling that group with the combination of high school recruiting and the transfer portal is going to be really important for Duke. And you need to create the variance within it. So you basically want to bring in an entire offensive line every year. They've hit the portal with a couple guys, and we just mentioned the high school guys that they already signed. They can bring that kind of completeness uh, to, to the group here going forward. And again, a lot of them out of state, a lot of them with no clear ties to Duke or, or, or that community. So again, fantastic job of identification and ambition from this coaching staff. Starting to wind down here on Lockdown Blue Devils, John Garcia Jr. is here with us, the director of recruiting for Sports Illustrated. Again, as you said, Duke football has 12 different states represented in their class of 2023 that they have signed around the top 50 range in terms of classes nationwide, which is a pride of point for Duke. And hopefully in the years to come, they can keep climbing up those rankings and that sort of thing. The one thing we have yet to touch on, though, John, with this class in particular Elko is a defensive guy. He needs to make sure that side of the football is secure. What can you tell us about some of the defenders coming to do? I got you muted there for a second, John. Sorry about that. <laughs> if we're talking about modernizing this program and keeping up with that, uh, the defensive group and the secondary in particular has to provide – some of that balance. Uh, Musa Kane, probably, I would assume for you, JJ, is the guy you've talked about the most as a, you talk about ready built safety, 6'1, 200 pounds out of Jersey, ready to go as a balanced safety, can come downhill, comfortable working backwards as well. But the rest of the group, th these are cover guys, right? Deshaun Stone, long, rangy safety from AC Reynolds. Shout out to Chris Pierce, my college teammate who played at AC Reynolds, big time program. And I love that, John, because I'm not kidding. I'm a graduate of A.C. Reynolds High hey, School. Hey, look at that. So, look, I, I love any <laughs> Reynolds mention whatsoever. Deshaun is outstanding. And, uh, yeah, anytime we – Rico Dowdle a few years ago at South yeah. Carolina, the running back. I mean, anytime we could do that, we love it. So, go Rockets, <laughs> man. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, and then and then beyond that, cover guys. Just cover guys. Kamari Robinson, St. Thomas Aquinas – storied program state champion guys who are just workmen like in their nature he can cover in the slot really important he can cover outside probably needs to work on the frame a little bit but there's just a lot of volume in the secondary here and that's where i think you see duke flexing a lot defensively um the front seven guys a lot of developmental types uh we know uh this is a group that elko is going to work with very closely. So these are the ones that you you feel like were identified very early on, or well, I guess the entire class was, but this group in particular, one that you're going to you know really identify early on, Samaj Turner, inside out pass rusher, depending on how his frame fills out, I think he could be really the defensive star after Kane in this class of 2023. So the group's got a bit of everything. Love the secondary hall and love the volume 
in the secondary in particular. Some of those guys can play right now. Some of them are developmental types that you need to put weight on here uh, going forward. But this is, again, this is a really strong group, and, and there's no positional hole that you can identify on either side of the ball. Oh, well, they were missing this. They could have used two or three more of the – no, everything was checked. Uh, again, a lot of skill position guys brought in, a lot of speed, uh, and a lot of modern ability uh, and versatility with, with this group. John, thank you so much for the time, as always, talking about this Duke recruiting class that has now signed, sealed, and delivered. Heading to Durham for Mike Elko and company. Tell us a little bit about your coverage of football recruiting and where folks can find your work. Yeah, SI.com for the written content. Just submitted my playoff predictions. Don't there feel great <laughs> about it, uh, but that's the beauty of, of college football. And, of course, we're talking ball at every level every day on Twitter. John Garcia underscore JR is my handle there. Thanks, John. We'll talk again soon, all right? Sounds good, JJ. Thanks for having me. John Garcia, Jr., joining us here today on Locked On Blue Devils.